how many of you guys are interested in using multi-site or using Kubernetes or using both? Just raise your hand. Okay, so we got the right audience, right? <laughs> okay, so first let me tell you a little bit of um, the history behind this. So, so let's start with the agenda. So let's see where KTS Garrett, that is the project in Garrett about Kubernetes, was started from, how say, it was founded and evolved, how we started helping the KTS project to improve, and we're going to see actually a real life demo, right, on how it looks like. So first, uh, what we're going to show today is actually a multi-primary Gary setup based on three pods at the moment, but that is not limited to three, it could be more than three. So we are going to see how Gary multi-primary with three pods can be used as a Unix service using Istio. How many of you know about Istio? Raise your hand. So Istio is an, an open source project on Kubernetes that is able to use Envoy. Envoy is the equivalent of HA proxy. It's just as say another open source project that is actually very popular in Kubernetes and allows any incoming calls of your incoming traffic to go and use different pods they are providing this service. It's a very versatile, let's say, HA proxy, just to give it a kind of executive summary. Can do a lot of stuff still. Can do, for instance, a lot of management of traffic based on um, some experimental system when assisting you when you do rolling upgrades, doing also replaying of production traffic to staging instances if you want to, and it's very, very flexible. Or managing all your stickiness or your routing policies or your sharding, whatever you want. So Easter is out there. We didn't we, we didn't want to bring them the wheel, so just KTS carry uses Istio out of the box. If you want to use something else, I know that some people, I believe from Palo Alto Network, so here in the Silicon Valley, they did uh, an equivalent integration that they put in KTS Garrett for um, uh, another system, right? I believe it's called Ambassador, right? And if you have yet another one, you're free to do it. So KTS Garrett doesn't force you to use this deal, but if you want to use it, it's there. And with regards to the communication between the three different pods, the demo we're going to show, they are not using any shared file system. Zero sharing, absolutely. And how do they get synchronized between themselves? They use two systems. The first one is a events broker, so a pub subsystem, publish subscribe. And in this case, we're going to show you Kafka, but there are many others available. I believe that Danny did an excellent presentation it was last month, so I encourage you to go and replay the ones that we publish on YouTube. And for preventing multiple updates of the same mutable refs, because that's the point, right? If you don't share the file system, how do you make sure not to end up in split brain? So you've got two different people pushing the same commit exactly at the same time, the same branch, what is going to happen? So we use Zookeeper for making sure that this doesn't create any split brain. And we're going to see that in practice. So where is KTS Garrett coming from? So KTS Garrett was initially designed by SAP and they wanted to use it for their own deployment of Garrett. So they wanted to move from uh, uh, bare metal on-premises to Kubernetes on-premises, right? And from that point of view, they wanted, of course, to implement high availability, and they implemented the high availability plugin implementation. And if you guys remember, it was initially done by Ericsson, but Ericsson did not finish the job, and Gary Forge brought it to a production-ready state. So they decided to go in this way. And of course, this model was based on a shared file system, right? And this is the architecture that uh, SAP put into KTS Gary. So a big shared file system where they are sharing repos and web sessions. And they also have the GitJC running on top. And they've got a cluster of two primaries. Now I'm going to tell you why it's just two, right? And a bunch of replicas. So why just two? Do you know, have you ever used NFS? In your companies, right? You know, there is good and there is bad. The good thing is that it makes your life easy, sort of easy, because it's not really a file system, right? It's a network protocol NFS. The bad is that your ability to scale is very limited because the more nodes you put in the same shared file system, you will notice that first, adding one node doesn't double your capacity, but just add maybe a 50, 60%. When you add the third instance, add maybe another 10%. You add the fourth instance, doesn't add any capacity. You add the fifth instance, it's going to be slower than just four. So, you know, your ability to scale is quite limited. Typically, we recommend in HA to have between two and three. 
but not going over four or five, otherwise it's going to get slower. Because the five system is becoming a bottleneck. The second problem is what happens if your five system is down? Being HA doesn't really help because all the nodes are going to be down. So it's a single point of filler. So what we wanted to achieve with the porting multi-site to KTS Gary. So first, we wanted to scale a lot more. So we started from three. To me, two is not enough because if you do rolling restart, you're not HA anymore. The minimum is really three because when you do a restart, you always stay at least with two nodes. But more importantly, we wanted to get, to get rid of the shared file system altogether. Why? Because first, as I mentioned, shared file system is a single point of failure. Second, it's low. Third, Elijah know better than me that Git and JGit, they behave slightly differently on NFS. There are so many bugs raised on JGit and on Git itself on NFS that is crazy. And the problem is not the stuff that we fixed. The problem is the stuff that we haven't fixed and we don't know yet that is working or not, right? So NFS has a lot of quirks. We fixed lots of stuff that they are still there. Second is low. Even if the throughput is very high, latency is not negligible, right? On the your local file system, you can get microsecond latency. You can never ever achieve this type of latencies on an NFS. So if your repo is not in a super duper good shape, right? If you got, I don't know, too many loose refs, too many loose objects. And when I say too many, I mean just even a hundred, right? Even a hundred could just kill your server. And some of the customers, they will say, hold on. On a local file system with 100 loose objects, don't have any problems. Why on NFS you got these problems? Depends on your NFS. And last but not least, we wanted to make sure that your experience is absolutely exactly as it was in your thing, right? So all this stuff has been implemented by Gary Forge many years ago with multi-site, but KTS Gary didn't have support for multi-site. So we brought this to the picture. The way that we operated, we got in touch with the first uh, SAP, we did an initial kickoff. The kickoff is published on YouTube. And then we agreed that the way to evolve KTS Gary in a way that was not breaking what they wanted to do, but is gonna allow you to do multi-site. This is what I'm gonna show you to you today. So we are gonna see still the three pods, not just two, three, but they're all act, having access to independent resources. So independent repo, independent indexes, everything independent. Just to give you an idea of what it looked like in terms of the operator, I know that it is kind of small here, but we will share also the uh, links that are pointed to this. So the type of um, uh, the storage class is all defining the resource, and the resource, they are all custom resources. So there is a new type of resource called Gary Cluster, and there is a Gary operator that will take care to get and manage this resource. And uh, I'm going to tell you what is written here. It's written replicas three. Don't be tricked. This is not Gary replicas. It means how many replicas the stateful set has. Another thing that is important is that you go and define the role of your cluster, if it is a cluster or primary nodes, a cluster of replicas, just as a single definition in your YAML file. It means you have a cluster or primaries that work. You say, okay, we like a cluster of replicas. You just go to the YAML file and you change from parameter to replica. How the magic works? The magic works in this way. That is, when you define this YAML file, you're actually not creating individual Kubernetes resources. So you're not creating your load balancer or your Gary nodes or whatever. You're just telling the Gary operator that is actually the core of KTS Gary that to say, listen, this is what I want. Can you please build it on Kubernetes for me? So whenever you go and change this definition, imagine I go to replica instead of say three, I want four nodes, then you don't have to do anything anymore. The, the Gary operator will take that definition and will change your Kubernetes resources in a way that matches that. And believe me, really, you put four, you got one extra node. How many of you would like to scale up your Gary server, your Gary system in this way? And because this one is not sharing the file system, you really increase the workload and the ability, right? So you re reduce the workload of the system and you increase the throughput. And Daddy was showing some graphs last month, but he was showing that the, the moment that we went live with that large client from, let's say, uh, HA, traditional HA to multi-site, it was just showing that the latency went down massively, then it was absolutely parallel, and really the throughput was double compared to what it was before, which is absolutely great. 
Uh, another thing that is important, so if you have multiple Gary primaries, how many of you got multiple Gary primary nodes? Do you guys have it? You know that you always need to fiddle with the configuration, which is painful. So you can use, of course, Ansible, but Ansible, Ansible is always, to me, some black magic at the end of the day. It's always tricky. You always need to manage it yourself. When you go to KDS Garrett, actually, the configuration is just one, regardless of the nodes. So you've got three nodes, you've got one config. You've got four nodes, you've got one config. Because the role of getting the config and tailor the config to the individual primary is done by the operator. So the config already contains, you can't read it there because it's too small, but contains already some keywords. And those keywords are getting automatically expanded by the Garrett operator, depending on the pod that this configuration is going to end up to. So you define your config in a Kubernetes config map. This is a specific type of deployment in Kubernetes when you define the config of the system. And all the secrets are going to be stored in Kubernetes Secret Manager. And what the Garrett operator will do, will get all of those. And when he's deploying the parts, we'll translate that into real Garrett config files. So you don't have to worry about the configs themselves in each individual part. And uh, this is just that kind of zoom in into the volumes. Right, so every single pod, so every single primary is actually two Docker containers. Why? Because you know that because the Gary operator needs to be able also to start the system, initialize the system, this also a container that is able to do the Gary init phase on that one. And then when it's working, it's using a runtime container. Uh, libraries, I believe we mentioned last month, we are using the global FTB event broker in terms of Gary libraries. And in this case, we use the Zookeeper, Kafka, and the web session broker. That's important. If you log into one primary, because of the broadcasting of the sessions, they will be logged in on all of them altogether. Uh, how Kubernetes looks like. So let me put the full screen here. So, can I, so I'm using here just KNRS, that is a useful tool all Kubernetes, right, to show you the situation of the cluster. So we've got now a cluster that is called uh, KDS multi-site. And as you can see, I've got three different pods. If you want to see actually everything that is in the cluster, there is a lot more than just Garrett. So you've got Garrett, you've got the Garrett operator, that is the guy that is responsible for applying the YAML configuration. You've got Istio, you've got Kafka, and there is also Zookeeper, right? A Kafka deployment and a Zookeeper deployment. If you go inside each of the nodes, you see that you've got basically um, two different containers. You've got a Garrett and you've got Garrett in it. And then also Istio needs to put additional container for doing the routing. And inside it's just a regular Garrett, right? So if you're familiar with the Docker distribution, you go to just Garrett and you see inside you've got everything. You've got the logs, you've got the configuration, and all looks like a regular Garrett. But inside it's all managed by the Kubernetes operator. You've got the config files, got everything here, right? All done. So coming back on how it looks like from a user perspective. So from a user perspective, this one is visible like just a server, like any other. In this case, we exported the, the uh, load balancer of the Kubernetes as gary.poc.com. Don't go to the URL, it just to say a local host. Pointed to that, pointed to the IP of Kubernetes. In this case, this is a Kubernetes setup on Google Cloud. So this is actually public on Google Cloud. And here you can just use it regularly. You can create repos or whatever. You can sign out, you can sign in again. And when you sign out, you sign in again. In this case, it's just a development instance. You're signing on all parts at the same time. So now I want to put the system to the stress, right? Because if I use the load balancer, and in this case, Istio is able to manage the stickiness. And stickiness is important because even if there is very quick replication between all the different instances, there is milliseconds replication, it's not really good to have your web page to serve by three different hosts. Because also your, page, your web page is making a lot of requests. Even at difference of milliseconds may screw up a little bit your user experience. So Istio does some stickiness, but with the stickiness, I cannot really try to put stuff in parallel to the notes. So what I did is to go and I'd open three different tunnels to the three different nodes. The first tunnel is Garrett 0, this one. The second tunnel, you see the port is 8081, is Garrett 1. And the third tunnel is 8082, is the third one. Okay. 
Yeah. So on that one, as you can see, they are in sync because if I do, uh, oh, let me sign in on this one one second. Yeah. So if I do, for instance, R plus two on this one, okay, is approved on all the others. This one is approved and this one is approved. So you can see there is almost real time update on the others. But I want to be really naughty. So I really want to create this situation where I create the same commit on all the three of them and see what happens. So I created here on this tab, I'm not gonna go full screen anymore. So I created here actually a repo that is cloned, if I do git remote minus v, is cloned directly through the tunnel. So the first one is cloning using port zero. The second is cloning using port one, and the third is cloning using port two. Then uh, I'm gonna do a fetch, a reset, minus r, origin master, okay? Now, let me do an echo of foo, right? Thanks. Call current. So what happens if I do exactly the same push exactly at the same time? Remember, they are not sharing the file system. So if I didn't have any global ref DB synchronization, what will happen? Split brain, that's right. Because even if you go replication, if you guys have been using replication, specifically the push replication, it takes a few seconds, right, to go through. So I will push the same commits on all of them, and then I will end up in split brain. So I'm going to do, let me suspend for a second the uh, sharing here. So I'm going to um, uh, amend the commit here, right? And I'm going to do concurrent one, right? And here I'm going to amend, right? And do concurrent two, right? Now they are different, okay? Good point. Okay, now let's synchronize it again. And let me do the change is the same, right? But this is real split brain, right? The same change with two different with three different messages. Let's do a git origin push origin master. As you can see, one succeeded, the other two no. Why? And they get exactly the same error from a client perspective, from a git client perspective, like it was a Sherify system. Fail to log. This is because your multi-site checks if the ref is mutable and if the ref is mutable it's going to do a compare and swap on the global ref tv and that is synchronized between the local repo and the global ref tv and if the compare and swap succeeds then the ref update is executed right and it's committed locally if the compare and swap fails the temporary ref update that was done locally is thrown away right and then of course if the other guys want to push neither can't because the ref has been updated, so they need to do a fetch. And as you can see, I pushed on Gary 2, but the pull replication already replicated on the others, right? So everyone else see the changes. They, if they really want to push, they need to replace whatever. We only check the mutable refs because you don't need to check the immutable ones. The, the immutable ones are immutable. So yeah, mm -hmm. you don't need to. You may be scared by saying, okay, but now if you increase the number of nodes, then a bunch of people are going to get all these log failures, right? That's not a good user experience. However, if you think about in your company, how many people are pushing directly to the branch? None or very little. The majority of the people, they actually create new changes. So what happens now if those three guys, they need to create three different changes, but simultaneously. As we mentioned before uh, with Danny, so in theory, you could have problems, right? Because Gary will start from the change change number, and then all of them will try to allocate the new change number. So they will conflict on the change number then. Let's see, is that going to work or not? So I uh, did here, I just did the script for creating a commit that is slightly different for the three of them, and it's called a change from. So I create a change from the user zero, and create a change from user one, and I'm going to create a change from user two. Okay, mm -hmm. so question now, in theory, we, I, would, I should get, again, a log failure, right? Because, okay, they're not conflicting on the ref because, you know, when I create three changes, the changes, refs are immutable. But Gary has a global ref for all different people with the sequence of the change. Will that succeed or will they fail on the sequences? Yeah, you know, so, they, so they should fail, right? No, each, each server is sharing the same sequences, right? And they've got exactly the same ref. And they go, whenever you create a change of one node, the others, they are bumped, right? So in theory, 
we should create some conflicts here, either a ref lock or ambiguity on change number, because if they get the two windows, they either use the windows I they want, and then you're screwed. Let's see what look. Oh, magic. First, the three of them succeeded. All of them. Why? Because created a new change creates a new ref, so no conflicts on the refs. However, there is a problem on the sequences. What happens? It happens that the three of them got assigned three different change numbers. So as you can see, by even scaling up the number of nodes, doesn't create conflicts of people pushing at the same time, and also doesn't create an ambiguity on the change number. How that works? Works in this way. Actually, you didn't see, but if we go on the lock, we can see it. The other two, they got a lock favor. But the lock exception has been captured automatically by Gary. And Gary is doing some retry logic on there. And actually, in Gary 310, the retry logic on Gary's server side has been improved a lot. So it means that when Gary sees that there is a lock failure, he tries hard again on the server side to see if the operation can be tried again. Some of the operation, they cannot. The push that we have seen before, they were, they were not able to do it. But the sequence, they can be retried. So the other two nodes, what happens is that they went into a uh, basically split brain prevention error, that is a lock error, right? They received the pull replication of the update of the sequence, the one that was actually happening first, and they retried the operation and got assigned a new change number and say, wow, gone. And then was assigned. So I don't know if you noticed, but before they were all responding at the same time. Now they went the three of them at three different times because only one of them that was successful, the other two retried and eventually succeeded. How are the change ID or the change number so different the process very yeah, that's a good question. So actually, Gary doesn't increment by just one. There is a window in thing, right? So basically, they just got different windows at the end of the day. And they started working on different windows of changes, right? And each one got a different window. That's why one was the window between 0 and 20, the other between 20 and 30, and the other between 30 and 40, right? Uh, I was just going to ask the follow-up. Uh, when you push changes later in the future, the one that was on 6, is it going to start hitting... The numbers that were now used by the other ones or they just skip leapfrogging on the windows yeah no they leapfrog on the windows because uh all the sequences are still ref and those ones are mutable so they will they won't be able to get a number that the other ones have got as well is there a helm chart for this oh yes so the helm charts are, are available for the garrett operator so it means you can deploy the garrett operator as a helm chart and the cluster itself is a very simple YAML and it's super easy to do a home chart for that. Bear in mind that we are not, in this case, we are not really leveraging all the specifics of Helm for implementing this, but we are leveraging the specifics of the Garrett operator. So the home chart becomes just a simple home chart of over deployment of a Kubernetes descriptor. All the three uh, primary instances that you showed are on the same site, right? So is there any any implementation that we have tested in other sites, like one in India and one in US? Yeah, so in this case, so the question, yeah. Uh, in this case, we did uh, three different nodes on the same cluster, right? We're still using multi-site plugin but on the same cluster. You could actually have multiple of these deployment on multiple clusters on multiple regions. Absolutely, yes. Though the way that you do is basically you connect them to the same Kafka topics you connect them to the same global RefDB, right? And in that way, they will basically share the same locking on the refs and they will share the same events distribution. Another thing that people didn't ask for, but I believe is a good question to ask is, what happens to stream events? Because this is the Gary side, but if you have, I don't know, an existing system, I don't know, Zool, could be Jenkins, could be, you name it, that is using SSH stream events. And what happens if I push my changes on Gary Zero, one side, and maybe Istio was allocating this specific CI CD pipeline to the third side? What is going to happen? Actually, they're going to receive the events. They are happening through all the cluster, throughout all the cluster. And this is because every event that happens in any individual node is going to be broadcasted to the others. Okay? My suggestion is if you're planning to go multi sites, Right? even within the same data center or across data centers, the best idea will be then to move away from SSH stream events and just having the CI CD just to listen to the same broker. 
So if you're using Zool, we actually had an interesting conversation last year with um, James Blair, and we were talking about multi-site, and James said, oh, does it make any sense to use stream events? So let's have Zool to consume directly from the broker. And actually he did. And if you're using the Jenkins Trigger plugin, the Jenkins Trigger plugin is the ability to listen to brokers for the stream events. I believe that there was a RabbitMQ implementation already out there. We added the Kafka and Kinesis. And uh, if you're using, let's say, you name it plugin, the same events you got as SSA stream events are exactly the same format on the topics. You just uh, say fetch from the topic and get events and react to events. What's the advantage is that if you are offline, for whatever reason, and you come back online, if you're consuming events from the stream events, you will get all the traffic that you lost in the between, right? In the meantime. Another thing that is important is that also the individual nodes, imagine that I've got three nodes, one of them is offline for one second, one hour, one day, one week. When it's coming back, hold on, you don't want to serve traffic to it, right? Because it's need to catch up, it needs to consume all the events. Because the indexes will be stale, then the repos will not have all the objects that you want, right? And you can't really serve incoming traffic until you're really not just healthy, but up to date, right? With the latest and greatest. So in 3.10, we have improved the health check plugin to accept additional checks. So I mean, the health check plugin is giving you the healthiness of Gerrit, but you can tell the health check plugin, hold on, I want to be called, I want to be asked if you really need to make this instance healthy or not, right? So it's pluggable because from Gary 3.9, the plugins can have inter-plugin dependency and communication. So the pull replication from 3.10 is able to tell the health check before serving traffic, ask me if I consume all my backlog or replication, give replication data, uh, all the indexes that I need to catch up and so on, everything. Last but not least, what uh, um, Danny mentioned before about the 310 and the Delta reindex, that is going to be super useful here because you can just put on the startup script of your pod, whenever you go up, just in case, do a Delta reindex. And the Delta reindex is going to be as quick as just a few seconds compared to hours or days. Before, it wasn't possible because if you're putting a reindex on the startup of your Garrett, how, how many hours is going to take in uh, your company? Six hours, seven hours, and that's not acceptable. You want to spin up your pod and the pod needs to be there. Start if you're getting 310, you can put a Delta index on the startup. And when the pod comes back, it's doing just in case the Delta index, you never know because you don't know how your pod ended. The pod could have been shut down gracefully or it could have been killed. And as Danny's mentioned, so the repo and the index, they're not necessarily and let's say in transaction, right? Um, do you have a roadmap of like future clustering um, features? Like, is there other things that you, you already have in mind? I would say from my point of view, I believe that really where we want to go is now a lot more, let's say, intelligence in sharding. Because at the moment, the multi-site has a very basic sharding, sorry, basic, very basic uh, location sensitive uh, policy for repos. You could already say this repo is global, but this repo is not. But uh, I believe with Istio now and KTS Garrett, Istio has the ability to, let's say, receive some sharding policy. And then Istio could be, let's say, improved to understand the sharding policy you've got on repos to say, listen, people are asking for this repo, but this repo is not a globally replicated repo, it's available only in Europe or available just in the uh, Far East or just in the US. Because sometimes, you know, companies are global, right? So they could have different legal requirements for storing data in different countries. I know for sure that, for instance, Turkey has specific requirements and also US has specific requirements for storing data. You don't want to store your sensitive data in a country where you're not legally, let's say, uh, allowed to do it, right? At the moment, Garrett and Multisai can do it, but I believe one interesting thing would be Let's have Gary to tell Istio that this is what you're doing. A way that your user just go to a repo, but they don't really know if the repo is stored in Europe and in the US, in the Far East or wherever. What known issues do you have with KLS Garrett? What you have seen here, it was completed last week, right? So it means that right now, KLS Garrett has only been, let's say, HA, 
and not multi-site. So we started in January with multi-site, and we were feature complete by last week. So I believe the big known issue is testing, 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 and mice, mice, and mice. You know, here in the US, there are self-driving cars, and the people that are developing self-driving cars and robot taxi, they know that when you're feature complete, it's not the end of the journey. It's the beginning, right? <laughs> feature complete, that's the beginning of the journey. So we definitely need to put this one in a lot of stress. We are very confident on multi-site because multi-site has been live in Gary Habayo for at least three and a half years. And we got lots of customers using multi-site. But honestly, none of them are using multi-site on Kubernetes because we just finished implementing it last week, right? So definitely, I believe it's testing. Testing, and I'm sure that we'll find lots of issues. I'm sure that so we'll fix many of them. Is, the big known issue is the unknown. The big known issue is the unknown. Yeah, absolutely, yeah.